Hello, I'm Jeanette Wing, and I'm going to talk about what's hot in computing. I like to talk about three drivers of computing, technology drivers, societal drivers, and science drivers. Today, I'm only going to talk about technology and societal drivers. So let me start with technology drivers. In particular, let me start with the substrates. We are going to have exascale computing. Exa is 10 to the 18th. How big is that? It's 100 times faster than the world's fastest supercomputer today. And two months ago, Intel announced that by year 2018, it will have an exaflop computer. And what's interesting is the challenge is empowering that computer. Because if we were to extrapolate powering a computer like that, given today's technology, it would take a nuclear reactor. And so what Intel wants to do is to be able to build an exaflop computer that will consume less than 20 megawatts of power. Incredible technology challenge. What can you do with an exascale computer? You can model complex systems with multiple dimensions at multiple time and spatial resolutions. So for instance, the geoscience community has a grandiose vision. They'd like to model the Earth from the Earth's inner core to the Earth's surface to the sun. And all the layers and systems in between, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, the atmosphere, and so on, the biosphere, and all the interactions of those systems. The medical community and the biology community would like to model the human body from the molecular level all the way up to the body itself. So that's what you can do with, with exascale computing. That's, on the one end, the big. On the other end, we have the small, nanoscale, 10 to the minus 9. We even have IBM having built a complete integrated circuit out of carbon nanotubes. Um, just to give you an idea, the width of a DNA molecule is on the order of two or three nanometers. And what's really coming is bio, nano, and info. So already, we have machines, computers, made out of molecules that can compute, do interesting functions. And what's interesting is where it's going is to put all these little molecular ma machines together connect them together so they can communicate with each other. And how do you think that's going to happen? Through chemical reactions. It's no longer going to be the kind of silicon substrate that we know and understand to, of today's technology. And then, of course, beyond even bio, nano, and info is quantum. Quantum is still to come. We don't know how to build a general purpose quantum computer. So those are the substrate trends. Now another trend in computing technology is the fact that we're drowning in data. Data, data, data. So the Large Hadron Collider is estimated to generate 15 petabytes of data a year. There's an instrument called the Square Kilometer Array that when operational will generate one exabyte of data a week. And you can now buy a DNA sequencer that will generate one terabyte of data a minute. So it's not even data volume anymore. It's data rate. And in fact, in what good is all that data? The data is completely meaningless unless we can extract the knowledge that's represented by the bits. And so many of the advanced computer science techniques like machine learning and data mining are being used today to mine all that data to extract the knowledge. But beyond that is what do you do with the knowledge? You want to make intelligent decisions. You want people who have the authority or power to, for instance, make policy decisions um, to use the data, the knowledge extracted from the data, to make these intelligent decisions. And maybe in the future, it will be not just humans making these decisions, but machines. Another trend is cell plus cloud. We already heard 
that there are 5.3 billion cell phone subscribers in the world today, digitally connected. In fact, think of that network of computers and humans through their cell phones as a distributed dynamic sensor net, collecting information about the environment at all times, communicating this information to each other. But the cell phone is just your portal to cyberspace. And it's in the cloud where you're going to be storing all your data, your, your images, your videos, your email, your calendar, and so on. Imagine the, the day when we get rid of uh, laptops and workstations, and all we have is our cell phone and the cloud. All the data, all the computation occurs on some um, hybrid of what's on your phone and what's in the cloud. Imagine that. Another trend is recognizing the, that most systems around us today, the physical systems, already have a digital component. I call these cyber-physical systems. Be they smart buildings with sensors to turn on the lights when people walk in, smart bridges with sensors to uh, determine the, and monitor the health of these physical infrastructure, embedded medical devices, um, or devices that you can put on your head that will read your neural activity so it can control a cursor on your screen. And the flip of these cyber-physical systems is when it's a physical entity like a human controlling a cyber entity like an avatar in virtual worlds. Another trend is robots everywhere. So we have little robots like these robotic bees and big robots, humanoid robots, that can serve tea in a cafeteria at work, or nurse bots that can work in a clinic, or you have huggable robots, that's what the robotic seal is, or robots that can vacuum your floor. Another trend in robots is cobots, a robot that is your companion, a robot that's your personal assistant. This particular cobot can take visitors in our building from from door to door and uh, accompany visitors uh, without any human escort. But what's interesting about this cobot is that it knows what it doesn't know. So when it gets on the elevator, taking the visitor to the ninth floor, it turns to the human and says, and says would you please push the elevator button for me? because it doesn't yet have an arm or a finger, and it can't yet push that elevator button. Another trend is the recognition that networks of humans and computers working together can solve problems that neither can solve alone. This picture is meant to depict the interconnectedness of humans and computers around the world working together on particular problems. And the reason this works is because we recognize that there are still some tasks that humans are better at than machines. For instance, reading this particular CAPTCHA, which many of you are probably familiar with, when you buy tickets online, you have to solve these little puzzles. Humans can do that. Humans can read that distorted text and type in the word and buy the ticket so that the ticket seller knows it's actually human buying the ticket and not a machine. More interestingly, we have games, like this particular game called Fold It, that people, um, um, the human intelligence recognizes that people are still better at doing 3D spatial reasoning. And this game is particularly uh, meant to solve uh, the protein folding problem. Very recently, in just three weeks, people playing this game were able to uh, discover the structure of a particular retrovirus enzyme that was eluding the biological community for over a decade. And here again, it's combining the intelligence of humans and the machine power through this distributed network that was enabling uh, this discovery of science. So now let me turn to some of the societal drivers. I'd like to talk about the high expectations that society places on our technology. As we produce more, they want more. 
So everyone wants 24 by 7 access, 100% connectivity, 100% reliability, that anyone wants to be able to access anything at any time, anywhere, whenever and forever. We're not quite there yet, but people want that. We are trying to um, uh, our technology is for everyone, from the rich to the poor, the old to the young, the able to disable, the literate to illiterate. Our technology is meant specifically for personalization now. We already see this when we do s searches or when we buy books online. We get these personalized ads that come up. But let's use this also for personalized learning and personalized medicine. And so one of the major trends right now in computing is to think about how advances in computer science can potentially transform some of the sectors like healthcare, energy, and so on. Let me just talk about the healthcare one. And you'll see all the trends I talked about come together in this picture. So we have this lady in India who uses her cell phone and stores all her information in the cloud. Included in that information is, of course, her genetic code that we have figured out and easily can compute. Um, and also, all the environmental data as she lives from birth um, Every single environmental and physiological characteristic is stored in the cloud. She gets sick one day, she has to contact the doctor. The doctor has available to him a model of the human to play what-if scenarios given any particular drug dosage. He has available to him subpopulations of the world, people who best match this lady's characteristics and all of her environmental history and all the possible drug treatments and symptoms that have um, been used for past uh, uh, h h clinical studies. Maybe, and all of this, of course, is based on analyzing all that data. And of course, they're going to um, communicate in cyberspace. It may be that she needs an embedical medical device put on her heart to monitor her heart and it's going to be a nanorobot surgeon that's going to be the assistant to the surgeon. And when she recuperates, she'll have a robot at home helping her with her daily chores. So that picture was for healthcare. I can show the very same picture for energy, environment, and sustainability, where I replace a policymaker for the doctor and a model of the earth for the human. So thank you very much. That ends my talk on what's hot in computing. <laughs>